Hi guys, welcome back here in the studio in Leipzig. Many interesting games already played, but now we have the Bundesliga primetime at 3.30 and we are coming to our next speaker, uh, Stefan Zuschke. Stefan is well known for his works in private equity uh, at BC as a managing partner for the last 20 years. But Stefan is also an interested or passionate football fan and player. And today he will combine in his talks business, leadership, and uh, yeah, business leadership and also kind of interesting talk. So see you there and good luck, Stefan, with your talk. Thank you, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Um, this is Managing Expectations, but I'm really pleased and honored to be with you, to present to you. Uh, still, to set the frame a bit, um, I am not a digital native. I am retired. Um, I used to have people working for me, and last but least, I'm in principle a pretty lazy person. That's why I don't have a presentation. So I'm just trying to tell you a bit, you know, from my history, from my background, what I think sports can learn from business, but more importantly, what business can learn from sports. And I wouldn't even I wouldn't even take it a big, big bit broader, since I think you know everybody can really learn from sports, specifically from soccer, because that's what we are talking about here for, for life. And I would like to encourage you to, to interrupt, uh, to ask questions whenever you think you didn't understand anything or I made a mistake or there's a gap, please, you know, jump in and uh, ask questions whenever you want. I think, you know, I would like to, to focus on, on, on soccer here, uh, although, you know, it was a bit of a broader spectrum with, with, with sports, uh, which doesn't mean that, you know, chess or golf or weightlifting is not sports, but it's not really my, my favorite sport. So, uh, and then also in order to be on the same page as my other esteemed panel speakers, let's focus here on, on soccer. Uh, briefly, um, as you outlined, uh, thank you Mia. briefly to my background. Uh, it took me quite a while to find, you know, my passion uh, in the job. Um, um, I started as a baker and then I moved on to be a waiter. And then one day my grandma said, come on, can't you do anything, you know, more, you know, reputable, uh, which I can share with my, with my friends. So she took me to the local bank where I made a two years apprenticeship. And then you know, the way life goes with uh, uh, quite a lot of serendipities and uh, lucky accidents, I came into private equity uh, and uh, initially Munich for a few years, but for the last 26 years uh, in Hamburg. Um, so, um, you know, I've always been, as you said, a big soccer fan, but luckily I never had to make money with sports, but I think still, you know, from my, from my professional experience, I have a pretty good idea, first of all, what it needs to be a good soccer player, but more importantly, which of those skills, you know, are incredibly helpful in business, but as I said, in broader, um, in, you know, in life, whatever job you do in the end. So when I think, you know, what can sports learn from business, it's not too much. Uh, there are a few things which are pretty straightforward and logical. First of all, don't ever forget your key customers, which in soccer are the loyal fans. And the core of every business is, as we know, the development, the creation, the invention of products and services which differentiate from competition. And this is key, you know, which can be sold in the market to existing and new customers and ideally with the goal of making some money. The idea of the Super League is a wonderful example of what you should not do. You know, create an artificial construct. You yeah, don't have to be Einstein that the only principal goal of that construct was to make more money. In addition, the plan was to exclude a key component of sports, which is competition. I mean, how can you plan a sports event, a project where no team can be demoted, no team can be promoted? Every participant has a guaranteed cash in, which is even in excess of what the Champions League winner makes during the whole tournament. So I think in the end, you know, we were all a bit, a bit, uh, you know, surprised. This thing was made up for disaster. We were surprised. Or I was surprised, and I'm sure some of you too. How many smart, successful people, bankers, sponsors, managers, came up with this idea after a lot of working, thinking, and pain? And uh, the result is known. The whole idea was buried uh, roughly 48 hours after the launch. And, you know, they simply forgot to think 
of their key customers, which are the fans. Another principle, even, even simpler than that, and it's logical and self-explanatory, um, you should not spend more money than you make. Uh, but although this is really a simple principle, some just don't get it, which again is why some of them need a Super League to get out of trouble. But I think these, I mean, these are very basic commercial issues, which I think some, at least some sports team should learn and could learn from business. Um, but um, I think I would like now to move to the other side, which I think is more telling uh, and is more excited to just see, you know, what can um, business learn from sports, from soccer. And as I said in the beginning, this is a bit comparable to what, you know, I keep telling uh, at least to my older kids who are roughly in your ballpark, 26 and 28. Um, I mean, I hope I can, it's easier for me to com convince you than my kids because they just tend not to listen to their parents. But I try to give them, you know, some key messages which also are related to sports and to soccer, which help to be prepared for real life and for professional life. First of all, whatever you do, whatever you do, you always deal with people. Some you like, some you don't. Whereas you can choose and pick your friends relatively freely, you just cannot always pick your business contacts, your business relationships. But you have to deal with them. So, you know, I think from my perspective, some of the key aspects which make life, professional life easier, and in the end, you know, make you more happy. And if you are more happy, you are more, more successful. First of all, and that's really a key point, first, you have to be authentic. And coming to soccer, I mean, Thomas Müller, to me, is one of the most authentic players I know. He is just himself. You know, the way he, the way he talks, the way he plays, the way he leads, he is incredibly authentic. And that's why people love to follow him, love to listen to him. But you have to be authentic. You have to be uh, yourself. You have to maintain a certain level of modesty because whatever you do you are always only part of a team you just cannot pretend you know to be the most self-confident guy if you're not you can't pretend to be you know extroverted if you are if you are uh, you know a very shy person you cannot pretend to be a team player if you are an egomaniac so you have to be authentic in order to be convincing in order to play you know to really uh, get people behind you and also, that's my opinion. If you are authentic, if you are, you know, your own, you, ha you are more convincing, you have more fun. And when you are convincing and you have fun, you are successful. Um, just, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to bring in, if, if okay with you, you know, here and there, some, some anecdotes from my, from, my, from my business life. And I think one nice example where uh, authenticity and modesty played a role was a, a process one side sentence, I mean, I assume most of you know what private equity is. In the end, it's about buying and selling businesses. Buying is, in 95% of cases, a big competition. Um, so, you know, we were in a competition for uh, the acquisition of a company, um, and management was allowed to invite a few players just, you know, for an introductory meeting for, to present ourselves. So, I don't know, they invited maybe six or eight players. So, we went down there to Bavaria, which, funny enough, was the village where Thomas Müller was born, but that's only a side aspect. So we went to this company, we presented ourselves, and then when we came home, you know, I wrote a letter, a personal letter, handwritten, handwritten to the CEO. Um, and in the end, you know, when we won the deal, he told me, you were the only one from eight invited parties to write a letter to me. Which to me is the, the, you know, the most obvious thing to do, just to thank someone and to be authentic and to be modest. So we still had to go through the process, but since management, after that letter, and there were some more things, you know, someone, you know, liked us and favored us, we still had to go through the process, but management always has, you know, some tools and ways to give you another hint here to tell you, look, I mean, here is an upside, which is not part of the business plan. So we could be more aggressive uh, in the bidding, and in the end, we won the deal, which is, we still own it, but, you know, it looks like a, like a pretty good deal. So this is something where, you, you know, I think authenticity, modesty, uh, you know, plays a role. And again, authenticity, I think, makes a really, really good successful soccer player. Second point, you have to integrate. You have to be a team player uh, because there are very, very few things in life which you can do just exclusively on your own. You need a team, you need assistants, you need employees, you need colleagues, and they only work for you. They only 
accept you, they only like you, they only you know learn from you and know they have a perspective perspective if you are a team player, if you really integrate them in your team. Third point, uh, also important, you need to be able to take decisions. And I think soccer is a wonderful game. It's a constant flow of decisions, whether to play, where to play the ball. Or goalie, does he stay in the goal? Does he leave or does he just stay wait? Do you foul someone or do you let him pass? Do you pass or do you, do you shoot? So it's a constant flow of decisions. This is something which you need in life. You can always say, you know, if I don't take decisions, I don't make, make mistakes. Wonderful, great, yes. If you don't take decisions, you just don't move. You are stuck. So you need to take decisions at the risk of making mistakes. Coming to a, uh, I think, you know, nice example or from, you know, of where a mistake or, you know, just a failure really fundamentally changed something is um, uh, uh, Bayern Munich, surprisingly. Um, if you remember the Champions League 2012, we played a phenomenal semi-final against Real Madrid. Uh, we won on penalty shootout away in Madrid. I was in the stadium. It was unbelievable. And we made it to the biggest desire of our Munich. We made it to the final in Munich, the so-called Finale da Home, uh, in 2012. We played against Chelsea. Um, we dominated the whole game. The whole game. I think Thomas Müller scored, I don't know, half through the second half. And then a few minutes from the end, Drogba, he scored after a corner with the only real opportunity these guys had. We went into extra time. Robin failed on a penalty. So we went into the, final, into the penalty shootout. And when you saw the players after the extra time, when they were selected for the penalty shootout, when Heinkes was looking for five players to mm -hmm. shoot these damn penalties, you saw everybody you know, turning the back to him. They, were, they, they just didn't have the, conf they had the self confidence. They didn't have the energy, the positive energy, energy to shoot these penalties. In the end, you know the end, you know, Manuel Neuer had to shoot and he scored and Bastian Schweinsteiger with the last penalty, he just tipped it against the post and we lost. So this was a huge foul, but the result of it, and this is the amazing thing, the result of it, they stood up, they made a few changes, um, they brought in players like Javi Martinez, but more importantly, they worked on the attitude, they worked on the self-confidence, they worked on the team spirit, um, and the result, I think, is well known. Uh, we won the Champions League in 2013 against Dortmund. Robin scoring the decisive goal two minutes from the end. And since then, we won the Bundesliga nine times in a row. So you see, you learn from a disaster, from a defeat, from a mistake, that you can turn out much, much stronger. And I think this, this unconditional willingness to win you know, never accept that the second place is okay. The constant proof and the self-confidence which they have that they can win almost any game, this makes them so dangerous. Flipping to my hometown here, Hamburg, uh, this is the other extreme. We have a team which is called ha Hamburger Sportverein, which is, you know, the number one here in Hamburg, at least that's what they think. They always thought for 50 years they can never be demoted to second division, but it happened three years ago. And since then, the expectations are so high for them of the whole city, they have to get back to the first division. They were, they were heading the table, leading the table, I think, all three seasons in second division. And in the second half, they just failed. They just failed because they don't have the spirit, the team spirit. They don't have the self-confidence. They don't have continuity in management. And so my, I would take almost any bet they, that they will stay down there for at least another three, four years until they completely remodeled and rejuvenated the team. Back to Bayern. You know, we had seasons over the last nine years where we were back by nine, 10, 11 points. Uh, but somehow, you know, this total willingness and this confidence that they were, can always win makes them so strong. Uh, another example, which I just find amazing, you know, we played in Leverkusen, uh, um, um, away and were 1-0 down. Leverkusen was the leader of the table. And then who else? Lewandowski scored the 1-1, two or three minutes from the end. And then instead of saying, you know, we are tied, you know, away with the, with the, with the leader of the table, they could have said, that's enough. But no, what did they do? They speed it up. They, 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 they opened up the game. They speed it up. They fought. And who else? Lewandowski scored the 2-1 in the 92nd minute. 
last example, which is almost my favorite, which is almost my favorite since, you know, it happened here in Hamburg. Uh, it was the season 2000, 2001. Last game of the Bundesliga, Bayern needed just one point to make it um, since Schalke was winning um, at home. Um, and I was again in the stadium in Hamburg. And then a guy called Sergei Barbares, he scored the 1-0 in the 90th minute. Any other team would have collapsed and just not gone up anymore. And what happened? Oli Khan, he took the ball from the net. He put it to the middle point and said, come on, guys, we have three, four minutes to go. We can make it. And then, and this is another thing which I think is amazing. Then we had this indirect, indirect uh, uh, free kick uh, in the 93rd minute. Uh, Effenberg was there. Khan were, was there. And Effenberg, who, was, who is a leader, who was the leader, he told Patrick Anderson, come on, guy, you should. Everybody said, why this guy? He has never scored a goal for Bayern Munich. And Effenberg, you know, he delegated responsibility to this guy, which is such an, you know, such a crucial point, which makes you successful in business. You have to delegate, but not only delegate work, but responsibility. So he delegated all his responsibility as a captain to Patrick Anderson and said, you shoot. And what happened? You know it. I've seen this goal 1,800 times. I still don't know why he scored, but he scored. In the last second, he scored. And they won the Champions League. And the poor Schalke champions of the hearts, as they were called, you know, they were, they were, they were the world. So anyway, back to business. What I'm, what I'm about to say, you have to be competitive. You have to want to be the number one. Even if it's only a small niche in a small market, you have to, you need to have this willingness to be number one because market leaders, first of all, they make more money. But, and I think this is the key point, market leaders, this is where you get the best people. Good people always want to go to the leaders. Maybe everybody wants to play for Bayern Munich. If you know, we, there is a war for talent going out in the market at the moment. In in almost every profession, you have to be a leader to really, you know, to really get the best people. So that's why I always like to hire people from team sports because I needed winners. I needed people who wanted to win. I think if you, I mean, I always would have loved to do my interviews on the soccer pitch because there I think you are authentic. When you see someone fighting, when you see someone, you know, how aggressive he is, how he leads a team, how he integrates, uh, whether he's happy if another team member supports, this is really something where you think this is, this, this, this makes a difference. Coming I mean, back to decisions, um, I, am I running out of time? Sorry. Um, talking about this decisions, I, I skip one episode. Uh, talking about decisions, I, I, I told you about soccer, which really, you know, it's, it is an event where you are constantly faced with decisions. And again, I remember the goal with Joshua Kimmich scored in Dortmund last season, 1-0, the one and only goal. He stood, you know, 20 meters from the goal and he saw, I think, just with one eye in the millisecond, the goal is a bit away from the goal. And he took the decision to shoot and he just touched the post and went in and Another point, communication. Communication is critical and you learn it in sports. You have to communicate. Why is Thomas Müller such an important player? Because he is an amazing leader and communicator. Now you hear it without audience, you hear every word and you hear him talking 90 minutes. He always inspires the team. He talks to the team. He leads the team. And that's why they follow him. He is authentic. He is the guy who can really lead the game. And this is something, coming back to business, which is so critical, especially looking at the last year. Corona lockdown, basically a global standstill, most of the employees in the home office. So what does it need to get people on board? Communication. It's the only way to really reach people, to motivate them. They want to know what the leader does, what the leader thinks, what they have to do. So communication is so critical. Again, something which I think you learn from sports, from team sports, from soccer. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, Thomas Müller, wonderful leader, but you don't have to be a loudspeaker and, you know, Radio Müller, as they call him, you don't have to talk all the time. Another example is Philipp Lahm. Philipp Lahm, um, you know, with his size of 170 centimeters, in his youth, people even said, you shouldn't go into soccer, you know, you're not a soccer player. What happened? He became the captain of the national team and of Bayern Munich because he has a natural authority. He almost doesn't make any mistakes. He's not a loudspeaker, but he has everybody's respect. And I think the best thing which he did, he retired at the peak, became a uh, world champion in 2014 uh, in Brazil. And the day after he announced, I will stop playing for the national team. And he said, I'll play another season with Bayern Munich, but then I'll leave. And this is so amazing. And this is something where I think business 
can learn a lot. Look at Wirecards. What's you know what's the key problem in Wirecards? Supervisory board. Their only role is to control the management. The management they were they were you know they were criminals. They had no clue what they they were doing. So these are people in our German, especially in our German environment, who are very experienced. Yes, they are relatively old, but they just miss you know major trends in the in 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 the world like digitization, like internationalization. So they are you know they think they are irreplaceable. They think they are they are they are gods. They can walk over water. It's not true. That's why I think people should learn from Philip Lahm and really retire at their peak. Not when they get carried out of their office or when people say, finally, 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 they leave. So I think this is something where you can really learn from Socrates. So um, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll skip a, a very nice paragraph, but I'll just summarize. Um, and uh, no, I think one point, one point is really important, and this is also soccer it's you have to be you know you, you need to have fun at work and I, i'll tell you one last episode uh we were it was 2006 world cup in germany and we had exclusivity for one transaction so um we knew where we had to deliver a certain price within six weeks so go through the whole process with our investment committee so we had six weeks to bring in to hand in a final binding offer and it was in the middle of the world cup we basically locked ourselves in the office for six weeks. Uh, we had a big TV. And we had every second day a fresh barrel of beer. But we were very focused on work. We really worked our asses off. But we always made a break when there was a good game or when German was playing. And this was so motivating. This was so integrating for the team. And in the end, you know, we won the deal. We made the deal. And again, this is a key part. You know, if you take all these parts together, you know, the, the team spirit, the motivation, the willingness to win brings you to success. And when you are successful, when you're successful, nothing brings a team closer than success. When you're successful, you really keep loyal people. So if I may summarize, if I may summarize, the key ingredients of a successful soccer team, which are all essential for success in professional life, are, from my perspective, authenticity and credibility, leadership skills and team play qualities, and delegation of responsibility. And it's communication, sharing of knowledge. It's to be decisive, ability to take decisions. It's the absolute willingness to learn, to improve, and to win. And it's a favorable work environment. And I think with these ingredients, you will be successful. And once you're successful, you get the best people and you continue to be successful. And just building the bridge, I'm finishing up, to building the bridge to uh, the next speaker. Congrats, congrats to Ilya and his team, Fahrenheit Bochum. I think most of what I just mentioned is true for Bochum. Um, I was not too surprised that they made it to, 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 to first division because, you know, they are an incredibly authentic, which I may say, a, you know, beer and bratwurst based club in their region. They have an incredibly wide and loyal uh, fan base. They have clear leadership in the team. They have a diversified but well-integrated team. And they have uh, a really disciplined management with clear roles and perspective for the players. So I think we will have fun with them in the Bundesliga. They match most of the ingredients which I just tried to summarize. And uh, with, that, with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if we have time for questions, anytime. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. I think uh, awesome talk from you. Um, I think we as business students can learn a lot um, from what you have said. Um, I picked a few questions here in the chat. For example, um, which other cl cl club in German football do you think is just a step away from success as Union Berlin or VfL Bochum? Just what, a step away? Uh, to, to be a step away from success as um, Union, Berlin, Union Berlin or VfL Bochum. Uh, uh, yeah, a step from success. So as far as successful as Bochum or Union Berlin? As successful? Yeah, in as the next step. So which team can be as successful as the next, next step as Union Berlin or VfL Bochum? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. 
Maybe Heidenheim. Heidenheim. Why is that? Because Heidenheim, again, incredibly authentic. I mean, unfortunately, they just showed, uh, sold Schnatterer, you know, who is their hero to, I think, Walter Mannheim. But, you know, they have an incredibly loyal fan base. They, it is it is a fam it's, it's, it's like a family. It's a family. Uh, they were relatively close for a few years. I think they, you know, they have the management. They have the continuity. They have the fan base. They are authentic. Um, I think, you know, uh, with a bit of luck, with one or two additions, they can make it to first division. Cool. Next question is, do you think there should be more clubs like Wolfsburg, Hoffenheim, Leipzig with strong financial backing in the Bundesliga to make the, the Bundesliga or the league more attractive and competitive? competitive? I mean, you know, being a Bayern Munich fan, I wouldn't mind winning the Bundesliga for the next 50 years. But I think it, 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 it is good to have competition and it's good to have really credible a competition. So I wouldn't mind. It has to be somehow fair. It has to be, you know, uh, um, equal for 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 everybody. But I think I think yes, that's what it needs. I mean, in the end, you know, we need we need uh, we need uh, uh, audience. We need attention, uh, and this only comes uh, with good teams, with close matches, uh, with an exciting and close uh, championship. So yeah, I wouldn't mind. And in the end, you know, we have to think international. We can't always just, you know, stick to our barriers and say it's Germany and Germany should be the only country which plays fair. No, we need we need support. Uh, it has to be, you know, in a, in a certain framework. But yes, I would be in favor, clearly. Cool. Thank you. And maybe the last question is more a kind of a personal question. Regardless of football or business, would you prefer to be the captain or the best player in the team? <laughs> Um, I think I would prefer to be the captain. Yes. Why? Yes. I like, you know, I, I really like to lead teams. That's what I've done for the last, I mean, not for all my career, but for the last 10, 12 years. I like to lead teams. I like to, you know, to see the support of the young people, to see that they like to work with me, to see that they learn from me. Um, and, you know, I don't mind if the other gets, uh, if the others get the credit. No. As long as you are in, as, as long as you lead a successful team, I'm really happy to share. I'm always happy to share. It's wonderful to lead a successful team. It's wonderful. And I want to have the trophy. Cool. And um, I also uh, thank you for, for sharing again. And I also get the information that we can have one another question here. Um, this is also an inter in, uh, interesting question because it combines football and business. Um, what do you think is the main difference in managing a company versus managing a football club? Is there a difference? <clears throat> I don't really think so. No, I don't really think so. Since, you know, the principles should be the same. The principles should be the same. You should have, you know, first of all, you know, a ha happy environment, happy people, happy players. You should be successful, uh, which, you know, depends to a huge extent from happy, good people and players. You should, you know, make money somehow. Uh, you should have the opportunity to grow, which means there means there needs to be, you know, room for upside. You need to, you know, provide what your customers want. So, you know, on one end, good products, which you can sell. On the other end, good soccer, good football, which people want to see. I don't think it's a big difference. I think it's it's difficult, but that's also, you know, sometimes true in other businesses. It's difficult to manage this, you know, this group of so diverse people, if you talk about the players. I mean, they are all, you know, millionaires. Uh, they have their own views. They have, you know, an amazing life. So it's not easy to manage them and to integrate them and to make a team. But this is exactly the difference. I think most clubs have amazing players, but if you can't, you know, make a team out of them. I mean, look at Ronaldo and Juventus Turin. Of course, he is an amazing player. He's unbelievable, but he doesn't integrate. And that's why the whole team says, you know, I'm glad when this guy goes. So I think it's really the integration. It's management of people. It's what I said in the beginning. You always deal with people, whether it's soccer, or business and you have to manage people and you have to make the best out of them and the best out of them is only working when you know you integrate them cool thank you stefan really much we are now um ending here our talk and going back to the semi-finals so i wish you a, a nice saturday evening or a sunny evening in hamburg and thanks for for having you thank you it was a pleasure thank you yep Back back to the commentary, so have fun in the semifinals and see you on the pitch.